What I want to talk about is perhaps a little bit more concrete in terms of the, uh, the sort of methods that we uh, might use and the place of video analysis within the corpus of social science methods. Um, I make no claim to originality for the first of these uh, descriptions of it's attributed to Clifford Geertz, the idea that you know, there are basically only two methods. Uh, Geertz, of course, is an anthropologist. I haven't actually been able to source this after extensive online research. Um, I, I cannot actually find Clifford Geertz saying this. Um, it's always an unnamed anthropologist speaking after dinner, but various anthropology colleagues assure me that it was Clifford Geertz. We said, well, basically, for all of human history, there's two ways in which we found out about things. Um, and we call them hanging out, which we might nowadays call participant observation. Um, you kind of go and have a look. Um, and the other is asking questions. Um, and this would have been as true of you know, sort of you know, early, early humans. You, know, you want to go, you want to find out what's going on with the tribe in the next valley. You, know, you, go over the, you go over the hill and you have a look at what they're doing and you ask them questions about why they're doing it, assuming you can find a common language for doing that. Um, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that because you know, there's this notion that somehow quality methods are new and fashionable <coughs> and the invention of the last 20 years or whatever. I get it a lot with medics. You know, they think it's new because they've only just discovered it. Um, uh, and, and, and the sort of really kind of classic stuff is um, what I call counting the cows, um, which is what kind of comes a bit later in human civilization when uh, the royal households of Babylon start keeping accounts. Um, and they invent, you know, they develop number systems, they develop means of recording. Uh, you fast forward towards the 17th century when, <clears throat> or the 16th and 17th century when you get the development of the insurance industry. Um, the whole kind of uh, analysis of risk, quantification of risk, um, the, you know, the attempt to support the development of mercantile capitalism in that period through the ability of uh, traders to take out insurance against losses on their voyages to Africa or to Asia or, or wherever. Um, and of course, in between there, you have you know, the development of literate societies where you get a whole bunch of other data, which is I call reading the papers. You know, you've got documents. Uh, so you can add to, uh, you know, anthropologists traditionally were looking at pre-literate societies. You know, once you get literate societies, you can read the documents that they produce about themselves. And those documents include visual artifacts, obviously, um, you know, paintings, sculptures, ceramics, uh, you know, the objects of everyday life. Um, and uh, but one of the things which, you know, hanging out has always struggled with is the whole issue of reliability and replicability. <clears throat> the thing about all of the others, the, the other three, is that you can actually repeat them. Now, you know, interviews, asking questions, you don't necessarily get the same answer twice because it all, it all depends upon who's answering, asking the questions. And you might say that one of the things that we've become a lot more sceptical about in the last 30, 40 years is the idea that uh, the answer to a question is, is a simple thing, that you can actually analyse it literally. And it's one of the contributions I think the conversation analysis has made to the refinement of interview methodology. Um, is that you know, asking the same questions does not necessarily guarantee that you get the same answers. You know, it depends on context, it depends on the interaction between the interviewer and the informant. Um, but broadly speaking, <clears throat> you, know, you, can, you can say, look, you know, we've got a document here, anybody can look at it. You know, we've got a bunch of cows here, anybody can count them and come to, the same, come, to the, come to the same number. Hanging out, there's always this issue of trust. You know, how do we trust the person who's done the observation? So recently, for example, we've had the controversy between um, Alex Goffman and Stephen Lubit, you know, where Lubit is challenging Goffman's ethnography of the black neighborhood in Philadelphia, um, very much around, along the lines of, well, you know, I, I kind of talk to the official sources and they say it's nothing like what she describes. Hmm. Now, you know, one example of this, for example, one example of this is, you know, she talks a lot about the interactions between police and hospital personnel in emergency departments. Um, 
And you know, if you go to the hospital administrators, the hospital administrators give you the textbook answer, which is that there are all sorts of legal prohibitions on exchanging information between hospitals and police officers. Now, as it happens, I've done field work in, in, in British ERs. My daughter you know, has been a patrol officer with the local police force hanging out in local ERs. And, of course, all sorts of interactions go on when, you, when you're there. <clears throat> and you realise that, you know, I mean, there are a whole, there's a whole kind of uh, folklore about police officers spending so much time hanging out in the ERs that, police, poli that male police officers marry female nurses. Um, or occasionally, nowadays, male, female, male police officers marry male nurses. But um, it's this kind of, you know, these sorts of things make sense to anybody who has been and seen. Um, but if you're somebody like Lubitsch, who's an academic lawyer, you know, who is applying, as it were, legalist, that kind of legalistic approach to evidence, um, you get quite, you, could, you, you have this issue of credibility, you know, if the chiefs in the organisation say this doesn't happen, obviously it doesn't happen. Well, you know, as we all know, that's, that is sort of nonsense. So the impact of recording technology, as Randall was saying, is a progressive increase in the ability to capture, freeze, review and share data. I think it's important to put that in the context of this movement from what people like Walter Ron and Jack Goody have described as predominantly oral societies, to societies which are predominantly documented. Um, in a world before writing, and writing, if you, could th if you think about it, writing is the original form of recording. You know, human action is on, completely on the fly. You know, the mo you know, everybody lives in the moment. You know, there's no such thing really as human history. Human history in a pre-literate society is what the oldest inhabitant can remember. Now, these societies develop very elaborate ways of making the world memorable. Um, if you look at, if you look at some, say, something like the Iliad or the Odyssey, one of the interesting things is the, which are on the cusp of that transition from oracy to literacy. You know, they're written down versions of oral, of oral accounts, but they're full of repetitious formulae. And the repetitious formulae are bound up with how do we make these memorable. Um, and the, there's a, you know, a whole body of um, anthropological work on this, uh, on, on this issue. Um, but what people like Ong and Goody are pointing to is, as we start to write things down, you know, we have independent checks. You know, we have means of verifying the, the memory. We have means of comparing what people say today with what people were recorded as saying 20 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Uh, and that's, you know, that is a revolutionary shift in, in the nature of human cognition uh, and, and human social organisation. And what we're seeing today is a further, uh, a further advance in that, a further generation of it. Now, of course, we can also raise, and we'll maybe look at this more tomorrow, some questions about, you know, is this a good thing or not? I mean, if you cannot escape the record of your past, you know, do, you know, does this actually have all kinds of effects on societies? Does it tend to ossify them? Does it tend to lock them into a, a pattern of control? Um, which is, you know, which may be contrary to the sort of evolutionary dynamic of change and innovation, which is one of the things that we're supposed to be touching on here, that maybe the dynamic of American capitalism in the 19th century was built on the fact that you could borrow a load of money from the bank in one town, fail at your business, and move on to the next state, or two or three states away, to move on to the frontier. And you could borrow a load of money from another bank, and you could fail. And you, could, you keep on doing that a few times, and eventually you get a business that succeeds. And something that, you know, where it, the dynamic economy takes off. You know, is it the case that actually the growth of credit checking, um, the growth of, you know, the, all of the kind of financial controls lock down Western economies and mean that places like India, you know, which may look, may look like a disorganized society, 
actually have a great deal more dynamism as the source of the next wave of innovation and, and capitalist development. I simply throw that out there. So we found recording, as Randall was saying, develops towards the end of the 19th century. I mean, the first practical tape recorders are developed by AEG in Germany during the 1930s. And they do actually come into social science relatively quickly. Um, I mean, the wartime technological developments liberate this kind of technology into civilian uses after 1945. <clears throat> and they start being used for social science interviews from a fairly early point in the 1950s. Um, and it, you go and get the sort of telephone calls, the classic foundation of conversation analysis. Um, Harvey Sachs and his co-workers looking at phone calls between Californian housewives in the 1960s because that's what the technology made possible. You get the uh, subsequent developments, the kind of lightweight cassette recorders which uh, people like you, me use when we started off. Actually, I started off using tape. Um, but the switch to cassette in the 70s, the digital recorders um, that we would use today, the developments in microphone technology, uh, the fact that we have uh, one, of, one of these <coughs> which sort of sits there. I'm not having to wear a radio mic. Uh, we have got a clunky great microphone. Uh, we can pick all of this up on the fly. Film, obviously, again, as Rand was saying, has been around since the late 19th century, but it's not a particularly convenient medium, medium for social science purposes. Um, I mean, you do get film uh, being used in social research, again, from the 1950s, and the Milgram experiments, for example, were, were, were filmed, and there's some, you know, the films of those are really very interesting. But you get this development of tape, um, but again, you can see the progressive shrinkage of the technology, um, the fact that it comes down from these kind of clunky cameras of the early 50s um, to the sorts of things that you would wear on your body today, um, and which are being worn by an increasing range. I mean, we've noted the use by police, but um, actually the um, hospital where I was recently in the ER uh, was using body cams on the um, department staff, uh, tracking their interactions with patients. Um, we've got a bunch of other uses being rolled out. Um, and I think they're going to become pretty ubiquitous in um, many occupations which have uh, contact uh, with the public. Um, again, it's this extension of a kind of organizational control strategy. So we get with the we think about the uses of video, 1970s, the static recording, so we start to get things like uh, doctor-patient interviews recorded fairly early on, police interrogations, um, I mean there's video material there from the late 70s, uh, classroom observation. Um, the development of the, the sort of found videos from CCTV, is a much more recent kind of phenomenon. And then the, in, the innovation of the life logging. Interestingly, that doesn't seem to be picked up by social scientists so much. And the people I've found doing that tend to be much more humanities people, artists doing it, or computer scientists. And we may want to talk tomorrow about the different regulatory environments that uh, computer science ethics committees seem to be willing to ex experiment an awful lot more with research and social science ethics committees. Um, and there's all sorts of things you could get past the computer science department that the, the, the sociology department would throw their, throw their hands up at. Actually, one thing that did occur to me, I, I have got this from Howie Becker, but who points to the coincidence that the, <coughs> uh, the invention of photography and the invention of sociology are almost simultaneous. Um, the first successful photographs of the 1840s, uh, late 1830s, um, pretty much coincide with Comte publishing um, his, his, his definition of sociology. This, of course, is not to say that sociology, people weren't doing sociology years before they got the label, um, but it's kind of a rather neat coincidence. The trouble about video is that it's potentially a very costly technology. I mean, the cost of collection is falling, but the cost of analysis is rising. 
and it's one of the debates that I've sort of regularly had with my students is, have you actually got a problem that demands video? You know, do you actually need that level of detail? Um, do you need, you know, is that, what are the issues about verification? You know, can, are people going to trust you if you just go out there and hang out in the traditional way? That's the sort of interrogation that PhD supervisors ought to be doing. Like, you know, okay, yeah, there is this whizzy thing you can do. It's like I always interrogate my students about, you know, do they have to use NVivo? Most PhDs don't have enough data to justify using the software. I mean, they always make you go to the glasses. But actually, you can spend so much time loading the data onto the, into the software that you end up running out of time to actually do any analysis with it. And if you've, if you've got something less than 40 interviews of, a, of about an hour each, there probably isn't a lot of point in using the fancy tools when the traditional methods are quite adequate. There's also, I think, this very important issue about the difference between what a camera sees and what an observer sees. I know I, I, we may hear sort of more about this. I mean, it's very much an issue with the police body cams. You know, I mean, my daughter does detective work now, but I mean, talking to her about you know how do we use the video, how do we use the body cam? It's like, okay, we go into this situation and it's kicking off a bit, and you say to the person, I am now switching the body cam on. And you know, the red light comes on to show that the, the recording, and the interaction immediately changes. And it's like, actually, like the body cam becomes the third party that, uh, that, that Randall was referring to. Um, and which, again, is kind of interesting. It goes back to some very old observations that we can now document. Uh, I mean, Adam Smith, in Theory of Moral Sentiments, writes about the role of the impartial spectator in defusing emotion in situations. Uh, and this being a very important driver for, you know, for, for, for humans de-escalating. Um, <clears throat> and you know, we can now see it, and we can also see that suggests that maybe the camera is, is working as a, as a sort of functional equivalent of that, um, as a kind of technological third party. When is the use appropriate? Well, I think that there are, there's a clear argument for saying that Video analysis introduces much greater accuracy and refinement in the analysis of anything that's based on face-to-face -face interaction or on interactions between humans and technologies. They are the sort of whole field of human-computer interaction studies where you know, kind of sociology, anthropology, psychology come together. Um, one of the things I ref <coughs> refer to here is some work that my former student, who's now a full professor in her own right, but I'd like to brag about it. Um, Alison Pilnick and I wrote this critique of power in medical interactions. Yeah. One of the interesting things about Dr. Patient is that we've now got close on 40 years of video. And what it turns out is that nothing much changes. Uh, we've had this whole kind of investment in communication skills training for health professionals. Um, a whole lot of it is based on this simple read off of, well, when you go to your doctor, your doctor asks you lots of questions. Therefore, the doctor is dominant, oppressive, powerful, and some or other, uh, you know, oppressing the, the, the patient. And we say, hang on a minute. You know, we've had all these years of skills training that's based on the principle that we should teach doctors to be, you know, less dominating, etc., etc. But actually, the interactions don't change. What's going on here? And we. What we argue is that basically, um, as Shegloff pointed out, um, many people have just been too quick to read off social structure in interaction. Though the first principle should be, you know, can we explain interaction phenomena in local terms? And if you actually think of a doctor-patient interaction, why do you go to see the doctor? You've got a problem that you can't solve for yourself. You know, what, is, what does the doctor do? the doctor tries to define the problem in terms that make it susceptible to a medical solution. Now, it may or may not be susceptible to a medical solution, but you know, that's the doctor's job. You know, if you could solve it yourself, you wouldn't go to the doctor. So it's pretty inevitable that the doctor is going to ask a bunch of questions. The doctor is not going to do the sort of thing that you see in conversation a lot, which is tell second stories. Um, 
the, you know, one of the things about ordinary conversations, I tell you, you know, I tell you a story, you have the right to tell me a story back. You'd think it was pretty weird if you went to see your doctor. You said, well, gee, I've, you know, I've got this problem with my enlarged prostate. Um, and it's troubling me in various ways. He said, well, yeah, fine, fine. Okay, well, let me tell you about my prostate. <laughs> um, so the, the asymmetry that we see in medical interactions, Alison and I argue, is actually based on what the nature of the work is. You know, it has nothing to do with doctors are rich, white, male professionals who are screwing over their patients. Um, you know, this is about what it takes to get the job done. And you know, we think that there's a lot more to be gained from adopting that as a first principle. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in, and, and uh, as Shagov pointed out, um, the, the local explanations are to be preferred, uh, but the meaning of an action is not something we read off as analysts. It's something that we find in the responses, in the turn taking, you know, the three turn structure. You know, one party does something, what happens at the second turn? Well, the second term tells you what the meaning of the first term was. You know, it's the response. You know, it may be a straightforward response, it may be a challenge to it, it may be a request for a repair. All sorts of things can happen there. Um, but that's what the first response means. It's not, it's not what you see as a, social, as a social scientist. It's not what you impose on the situation. Which is why, actually, Randall, I completely disagree with you about Bourdieu. I mean, Bourdieu just finds illustrations for what he knows already, along with Harry Becker and a bunch of Becker's French colleagues. I think Bourdieu, Bourdieu is a bit of a charlatan. Um, and, but, you know, we can have that debate on another occasion. But then the question is, OK, beyond, when we move beyond these face-to-face -face interactions, to what extent do we, if we study an organisation, for example, um, what, would, what would we gain by video material on, let's say, a study of resource management. Um, we may want to talk to people. Uh, another of my former students, uh, Davina Allen, writing on the invisible work of nurses. It turns out that, again, there's this whole kind of critique of, nur of nursing in Britain, which is all about, well, you know, they don't spend any time at the bedside anymore and the patients suffer, uh, and they're all over-educated. And actually, nurses don't need degrees, they just need tender hearts. Um, well, you know, if you actually look at the work of nurses, it's very sophisticated, very technological, and most of what they do is gluing the organisation together. And if you don't actually have the space for doing that, and you don't recognise that that's one of the most important things that nurses do in any hospital, then you know, you're, you're making some ser very serious mistakes about how you ought to train them and uh, how you ought to deploy them. So, to finish, Beware of turning video analysis into a gold standard. I think there's a, a very, um, I think there's a certain risk about that. I, I think it's important that we identify when it's appropriately used and we do articulate a strong case for using it that way. But I think we also need to recognise that traditional ethnography can be improved by a sensibility what video analysis has to offer. It's like I think all, all participant observers should, be trained, should have some training in conversation analysis, not to make them conversation analysts, but actually to help them to listen better to the talk that they're hearing. And, and indeed, I think it's important for interviews, interviewers as well, for interview research as well, that understanding interviewers as social interaction, as a conversational interaction, um, helps you to un un understand the nature of the data that you're getting and the co-construction of that data and the extent to which the responses that you're getting to your questions are responses to your questions rather than literal descriptions of what you're asking your informant to report upon. It's something which I would say informed my own research on child protection. There's a I've written about a, an analysis of a court hearing from a hand note of the interaction between the, um, the attorney uh, and, and a witness, which interestingly has some very direct echoes of 
the videos that I was looking at at a similar period of the uh, Greg Matosian's work on the um, Kennedy Smith rape trial, which is one of the kind of classic studies of cross examination. If you like, my ability to hear what was happening as a field worker was much sharpened by my understanding of uh, you know, how this sort of thing played out with, with video data. I think in the same way video analysis helps field workers to see things, to see the world more precisely. Um, I've recently been corresponding with Paul Atkinson, who's it's a slightly different approach. Paul is one of our sort of leading field researchers. Um, and he, recently he's been studying drawing. And he's been studying drawing because he wants to understand how artists see the world. But also to use those insights as a way of sharpening his own ability to observe. Um, now, you know, Rand is touching on the sort of generation of things. I mean, Paul's about the same age as me. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting that he's taking this whole new technique up. He said one of the things that he learned from going to a drawing class was that artists look at spaces as well as objects. So that the line that you draw around an object is actually defining the space between the objects as much as defining the objects itself. And he's not quite sure how we use ideas like that, but it gets him into a different way of thinking about what he's seeing in the field and sharpening up his, you know, as he sees it, sharpening up his own skills for seeing. Um, and I, I, th I think it's an interesting question. I mean, would we, would we conventionally send uh, students doing a PhD with participant observation to, to art classes? Um, maybe we should. I mean, maybe that's a voice that we actually don't have around the table here. And it would be an interesting one to, <clears throat> to incorporate. Anyway, I've talked for quite long enough. Um, and I've probably provoked enough people sufficiently. Um, so I'll leave it there.